see, what's really amazing about the Bible is that the words of the Bible are really tomorrow's headlines. And they've already been written. They're already in place. You see, Russia has been looking to the south for many, many years. See, it's back from 1453 when Muhammad II pushed the Byzantine Empire and Byzantine Emperor and the Church out of St. Sophia's in Constantinople that Russia has had its designs on going back there and retaking St. Sophia's, which by all accounts is the Vatican of the Eastern, or Eastern Orthodox religion. It was taken in 1453, and over and over again it's been stated that they want it back. In fact, the Russian uh, crosses on the roof of the Kremlin, you'll notice they're a little peculiar. There's a cross, but what's underneath those crosses? Well, it's the crescent moon. Because Russia has made the vow for many, many centuries that they will return to Constantinople, and they will take Constantinople, and they will take back uh, the city of uh, Constantinople and St. Sophia's. So we have, in the Bible then, the headlines of tomorrow already recorded for us. And that is that Russia is going to invade Turkey. This is written in the Persian Post by a, a prophet Daniel, a correspondent living in Babylon in 539 BC. And he says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, that's Turkey, and the king of the north will come against him with like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he's going to enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. So St. Sophia's, after 560 years, is going to return to uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. And so, or the Russian Orthodox Church, or the Eastern Orthodox religion. The invasion of Turkey, then, is given to us. This is what is described for us, that they're going to come down into Turkey, um, but it's not just going to stop there, but it's going to pass over, and it's going to enter into Turkey, and then it's going to continue on into the rest of the Middle East, because it's going to overrun, further than that, right into the area close to Israel. The same prophet, Daniel, reporting from Babylon 2,554 years ago, tells us that he's going to enter into the most glorious land, which is Israel. Many countries are going to be overthrown, in fact, but the ones that are going to escape out of his hand is Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, which we call Jordan today. So Israel, the glorious land, is going to be overrun, but Jordan is going to be under Western protection. Uh, the coalition basically will protest the invasion, but not really be able to do a whole lot to stop it. So they're going to move on from here down into the area of Israel, but the ring of uh, Western powers are going to stop them from entering to Jordan, uh, the Ammon, Moab, and Ammon that we read about in the, uh, the book of Ezekiel and of Daniel. However, they're going to move on from there, and the prophets tell us that Russia is going to invade Egypt. Daniel goes on to say that he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt, and he will have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians are also going to be at his steps, or as it's put in another translation, marching in his footsteps. So Russia then is also going to move down and is going to invade Egypt itself right into the area of the south, going through Israel, and into Egypt. And uh, the prophet Isaiah describes how it will be given to the hand of a cruel lord. But, there's going to be rumors, intelligence reports, that are going to take place, that are going to cause the Russians to leave. Russians will withdraw to target Israel. Intelligence reports will spread panic in the Kremlin. We read in Daniel 11:44, tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury and destroy and utterly to make away many. So they're going to turn their forces around, wheeling them out of the land of Egypt and heading up into the land of Israel, where the great battle of Armageddon is finally going to take place. It's going to be a terrible time. And the headline again has already been written. That is that Jerusalem is going to fall. Israel, as it currently stands, is going to collapse. Its current government is going to be brought down. Russians are going to basically take the city, pillage it. The inhabitants are going to be taken captive, and prayer vigil will be given by desperate Jews, as we read elsewhere. Zechariah 14, verse 2, 
So here's a prophet. This is the Judean times. He's writing in 520 BC, describing the scene inside the city. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's the gathering, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Daniel, and so on. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city shall go forth into captivity, but the residue of the people shall not be cut off. It's not going to be complete victory. There still will be a remnant that remain there. And Joel describes also how they will pray to God. In fact, what they're going to do is establish their headquarters right in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. The Russian headquarters will be established in Jerusalem. The Temple Mount will be the Russian HQ. Israel resistance will be wiped out and thousands will flee to Jordan. So much for honoring their agreement with the Arabs, they want the holy places for themselves. Remember that whole crescent moon under the cross? That's really what's going to happen. Once the Arab pawn is no longer needed, they'll just toss it to the side. He will plant his tabernacles of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which of course is Mount Zion. And the Middle East will be plunged into the great battle of Armageddon. As the prophet John, writing in the Patmos Press, has to tell us, Middle East Armageddon. Divine intervention, though, is going to destroy armies in Israel. So the kings will go forth. Uh, unto the, sorry, which go forth to the kings of the earth, and the whole world gathering them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. He gathers them together to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And then the prophets tell us that this is when divine intervention is going to actually happen. There's going to be a massive earthquake that's going to devastate the Middle East and destroy the Russian forces on the mountains of Israel. It's going to split the Mount of Olives in two. Divine intervention is going to take place as we are told by Zechariah the prophet in the Judean news writing in 520 BC. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the Mount of Olives. He says in chapter 14 verse 4, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and the west, and there's going to be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove towards the north and half towards the south, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley shall, of the mountain shall reach unto Azal, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So this is going to be a time of great trouble such as never was, but the Russian forces are going to be devastated by this earthquake. In Ezekiel chapter 38, the prophet Ezekiel uh, in the Chaldean Courier, writing from the river Kibar 2,608 years ago, describes the scene. He says, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. He goes on to say, the mountains shall be thrown down, and every steep place shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. He says, I'm going to call for a sword against Gog, that is, for at all my, nation, my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. And there's going to be pestilence and blood, and there's going to be overflowing rain and hailstones, fire and brimstone. So civil war, plague, burning hail and the infrastructure destroyed by a massive earthquake, which scientists tell us to do what's described here, would have to be around the number of a 9.9. .9. So San Andreas and end of the world 2012 or whatever it was has nothing on any of this. This is the real deal. This isn't Hollywood. This is the real activity that's going to take place very soon when the whole world is going to be brought to its knees. And the Russian forces are going to be annihilated in the Middle East. This is not going to be an invasion that is going to be a victory for them. God brings them down there to destroy them and to set up his kingdom upon the earth. And that's the next headline. Kingdom of God set up on earth. Christians in disbelief. Jews return to the land. See, Christians believe that the kingdom of God's in heaven. Yet we've been praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth for many, many years. But now we find out that the Lord Jesus Christ is actually going to come back and set up a kingdom on the earth. Daniel chapter 2, the captive chronicle again, verse 44 says, in, these days, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it's going to break in pieces and consume all the other kingdoms of the world. And it's going to stand forever. In fact, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35, it says, it's like a little stone that's going to hit the image and grow to become a mountain that covers the entire earth. And at the center of that, the Judean Times tells us, writing 2,770 years ago, there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem. Yes, friends, a temple built in Jerusalem 
by the Jews where there will be animal sacrifice once again. The Dome of the Rock, built in 691 AD, is going to be gone, raised by the earthquake. And it'll come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountains and be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto us, is what we read from the prophet Isaiah 2,200 or 770 years ago. That is going to be the center of the kingdom of God on earth. And the next headline is, is that when that takes place, Messiah is going to be placed upon his throne. King David, writing from Jerusalem 2,986 years ago, described how God would set his son upon his throne in Zion. He would issue a decree to all the nations to honor his son, and they will take counsel together again against him, but God's going to laugh them to scorn. And the rebellious nations will be broken into pieces like a potter's vessel. See, this is what the angel Gabriel decreed when he spoke to Mary some 2,020 years ago in Nazareth. This is what he has to say. Luke chapter 1 is where we read it. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. What is it that God's going to give him? The throne of his father, David. Where is he going to reign? Well, he's going to reign over the house of Jacob, which is the nation of Israel, forever. And of his kingdom, there's not going to be any end. Well, years ago, when lots of schools used to put on nativity plays, hundreds of years or, you know, of, of this going on, which is all sort of mostly gone out of schools today because, you know, we can't have the Bible, we can't actually trust in God, even though that's what's on the coins and in the national sort of oath of allegiance and in our national anthem in Canada as well. All that has to go, we have to kind of pretend it all didn't happen, right? When schools used to do plays, like I did when I was a little boy in a Christian school back in Britain years ago, we used to act this out. And we used to have Gabriel come. And Gabriel used to say, that, you know what, you're going to have a son, and he's going to reign, sitting on the throne of David, ruling over Jacob forever, the house of Jacob. Now that kingdom is going to be no end. What? What's changed? That is the story. Messiah is going to be placed on the throne. That's what Psalm 2 is all about. Well, the prophet Micah in the Judean News, prophesying 2,755 years ago, tells us that the law then is going to go forth from Zion. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and we will walk in, he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, that's the mountain in Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that, friends, is what is finally going to bring about this great headline. Peace on earth. Because that's what Gabriel was talking about. That's what the angels were announcing when Christ was born. And we read in Isaiah 2 what he's going to do, what the United Nations just cannot do. But he will. He will judge amongst the nations, rebuke many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That is the end of the story. Righteous rule will bring peace on earth. It's a real roller coaster ride till we get there. And we're sitting at the very top of that roller coaster as it goes up. I hate roller coasters. The part I hate the most is the part where they put you in, click, down goes that thing, the belt goes over, and then it's kajunk, 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 as you go all the way up. Because you get to that very top and you're just waiting to get rocketed off. You know, that's the anticipation. I don't like heights to start with, so that part there just terrifies me. But friends, young people, that's where we live. This whole thing's about to launch. The roller coaster is right at the crest. There's no stopping it. It's going to go at any point in time. And when it does, it's going to be a great ride. It's going to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. And it's the fulfillment of what God's told us in the prophets. Bible prophecy, God declaring the end from the beginning telling us well in advance what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Declaring the end from the beginning and ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. There's one last ad I'd like to share with you, though. It's a wanted ad. It appears in the Judean news. 
and it was written many, many years ago, wanted kings and priests, kings and priests to reign over the earth, must have the right characteristics, benefits, a mortal life, and accommodations forever. Because that's what we read of in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. Now, he doesn't promise us to sit with God in God's throne in heaven. He says, no, 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 you can sit with me in my throne. Well, what's his throne? It's the throne that was promised to him in Jerusalem. That's where we are promised. But you have to have the right qualifications because he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling over or ruling in the fear of God. And that's why it'll bring peace on earth. So that's the story, brothers and sisters, that we've looked at in the last little while. Those are the headlines that are going to appear in the next little while. We've been invited to be a part of it. It's exciting times that we live in. But when we were kids, we used to play a game called hide and seek. Somebody would go and hide, or they would hide their eyes, and the rest of us would run out into the woods or wherever it was in the house, and we'd all go hide. And then they'd have to come and seek us. And that seeker would call out to the kids that were all hiding, ready or not, here I come. And the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come, whether we're ready or not. So we better prepare ourselves for that great day. Thank you.